I want to start with the baguette, firstly, and the most important question, I think, for the whole day. Do you cut your baguette with a knife or do you break it off? It depends on how I'm using it, I have to, I have to say. Uh, but most of the time, I'm a ripper. I really, I'm a ripper. <laughs> Bonjour, this is Fabulously Delicious, the podcast that's all about delicious French food and the people that love it, cook it, produce it, talk, write, and photograph it. I'm Andrew Pryor. My motto in life is whatever you do, you should do it fabulously. And each week, my guests certainly do that. Join me on Fabulously Delicious as we indulge in everything French cuisine, not just here in France, but around the world. Today, we are spreading butter on our bread and talking about the institution of French bread. From baguettes to sourdough, boulangeries and even baguette vending machines, starters or dried yeast. We'll find out how the modern world of French bread today is different from the past. To rise into the subject of French bread, did you hear what I did there, rise? Mm. I'm joined today by a fellow podcaster, a YouTuber, author and food journalist, Katie Quinn. Katie, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. I'm so excited to talk with you. Katie, I want to jump right into it today because I feel that with French bread, like I've only got about 40, 45 minutes and I think we could talk for hours and hours and hours. I think we could talk for years, in fact, about French bread. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, I want to start with the baguette, firstly, and the most important question, I think, for the whole day, for all of our listeners and for everybody out there in the world is... Do you cut your baguette with a knife or do you break it off? (laughs) I, it depends on how I'm using it. I have to, I have to say, uh, but most of the time I'm a ripper. I really, I'm a ripper. (laughs) I don't know. What about you? Well, I'm a ripper, but I've usually, when you have guests over, I've like sliced up the baguette for the guests and and the French are always like, oh, you slice the bread. But I'm wondering, like, when you go to a, a bistro or somewhere like that, and they put a they put a basket of bread on your table, it's usually sliced. So what's the problem? Yeah, no, that's interesting. I mean, it is interesting. I think that the kind of bread itself almost gives you an indication of what it wants. A country loaf, a, a, a really crusty country loaf, pan de campagne like a French crusty round boule. That's actually difficult to just rip off a piece. It is not inviting you to. It's in fact saying, yo, you better go get your knife if you want to get into me, right? And I would say that the baguette, uh, the baguette is is kind of in the in-between. It al- It's like, oh, okay, I'm going to allow you to rip off a piece or cut me. It's up to you. Katie, you didn't start your career in food, did you? You have a media background and I think actually acting. Is that correct? <laughs> How do you know this about me? Oh, I mean, I've it, done my research, Katie. I am I am impressed. I'm pretty sure I saw you on The Bold and the Beautiful once. I don't think that was me. Oh, damn. <laughs> Although I did, I, although I did do a bunch of, there was a period of time where I did a bunch of like extra work. So you may spot me as like an extra in all kinds of things. Oh, I was, uh, I was in a Rob Thomas music video, maybe. (gasps) (laughs) Fabulous. Yeah. Not quite bold and the beautiful, but. I've always wanted to be an extra. I think my best work could be done silently. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's all in the facial expressions. So I think that you've got that down. And also in the late noughties, you were, uh, well, actually, I should say noughties, uh, yes, 2000s. Yes, that's it, the noughties. You had an amazing experience. You were working in TV production in New York. Yeah. Name some of the shows you worked on, like. Saturday Night Live, The Today Show. Oh, my gosh. Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. It was cool. Yeah, so it's this program at NBC called The Page Program. And it's basically, uh, it's for people just at the beginning of their career willing to be a guinea pig running around 30 Rock, running around that building. Um, And, you know, it, it was an amazing year because I got to dip my toe in so many aspects of the industry. And and just like you said, like I, I have a media background, a media journalism background, less uh, food as it has turned into. Although that was when I realized, okay, media, ob- and you know, this is, it is kind of obvious to say it like this, but media is an umbrella, right? And it encompasses so many things. And so just because I studied production at university, 
uh, d- doesn't mean that that's all there is to it. So I guess I was seeing when I worked at the Today Show, for instance, I got to talk with and interview the chefs who would come on the show. And I got to then write articles for the Today Show website about my conversation with them. And that is really when I realized, oh, this budding interest I have in food, this there's an outlet for it within the media industry. So, you know, chefs like Thomas Keller, Daniel Boulud, Tom Colicchio, you know, Ina Garten, you know, you know, Martha Stewart, like all of these, all of these uh, really incredible big name food personalities would come through the studio. And this is also when I realized, oh, maybe my interest in food is slightly different than everyone else's interest in food because people would like freak out if Kim Kardashian came through the studio. And I was like, what, whatever. Did you know that Daniel Boulud is here? Like what? Like, and so <laughs> I was like, I want to go talk to him. Uh, and that's kind of when I realized, oh, maybe there's a career in food media. Like myself and last week's guest, actually, Molly Wilkinson, the three of us have something in common that we What's all studied that? at Le Cordon Bleu in yeah! Paris. Yeah! What uh, was that cool. experience like for you? Well, I, I'm about to flip this question back to you. Um, the, the experience was incredible. Um, it kicked my little tush though i mean it really it really really did like i i have to say i went into it thinking so i went into it let's see i was 29 i think um i had started the youtube channel i was doing f- you know food a lot of food stuff and for me it was just as much knocking imposter syndrome out of my brain as anything because i was like okay now i'm this like I'm a food person or starting to become one. And I, and I want to continue this. I want this to be the trajectory of my career in order for that to happen though. I really feel like I need to gain some credibility. Um, I did not feel like I was deserving of like anyone asking me anything about food, which again was imposter syndrome because I don't think that, that people have to go to culinary school to be incredible cooks, but it did make me a better cook without a doubt um it kicked my butt how was your experience um exactly that's it it's interesting that you say that because it's exactly the same experience i definitely think from uh, especially from my point of view from being on master chef in australia oh my god that's so cool i didn't know that about you <laughs> so there are people out there that uh absolutely love the idea of master chef and and love the fact that you know that you're on that and that and it's an amazing experience there's also the negative side of there's some people especially there's some people, it's more so within the industry, but there's sort of this sort of, you know, look at people that are doing that and well, you didn't go to culinary school, you didn't um, apprentice as a chef, yep. you haven't worked in a professional kitchen. Yeah. So there is that imposter syndrome going on there in your head. The, uh, the other reason why I did it was I did pastry in particular and it was, I, the reason why I did that was that it was, I felt that that wasn't my strength. Yeah. And so I wanted to learn more about That's it. Smart. That's smart. Did really you do uh, culinary or I pastry did. or belongery? So, <laughs> so I, I did culinary. Kind of funny story. I, I had initially signed up to do culinary and pastry. And so pastry right after three month beginning culinary and then the three month beginning patisserie. And what happened was that the school kind of messed it up and they didn't get me a visa in order to stay beyond the three months of a tourist visa for that Cuisine de Bas program. So I had signed up, but then it was like, well, I don't have the visa to do it. And in order to get it, I would need to fly back to the States and do it. And and I can't do that. Uh, there's literally no time because the patisserie course is supposed to start the week after the cuisine course ends. So I didn't end up doing that, which I do regret at the same time um, going back to New York at that point. Th- you know, things already started kind of like kicking off and going in a certain direction. And like, who knows what would have happened if I had had stayed in Paris that longer time. So who knows? You know, it's always impossible to know what would have happened uh, in life if you did one thing or not another. Exactly. Yes. Um, your first cookbook was all about avocados. 
Yes. And now your second book is uh, Cheese, Wine and Bread, Discovering the Magic of Fermentation in England, Italy and France. <laughs> I'm fascinated by this idea of um, or the thought of fermentation and how it's uh, uh, and its history and difference in countries all around the world. What made you decide to do this book in particular? So many reasons, so many motivations. I think that, you know, this book, it is a lot of things it's part cookbook and it's part travel narrative and it's part nerdy fermentation guide and it's part artisan profiles. And I think for all of these elements of it, uh, I was motivated by, by different parts of myself and different parts of thing, you know, things that interest me, different books that I am grab that I have gravitated towards and that I love. So I think that it was kind of cobbling things together after the realization that my three favorite things, cheese, wine, and bread, the things that I could just have on my dinner table every day for the rest of my life and not have a another need in the world, that these three things are all fermented. I think that was the spark when I was like, a lot of other people are like me. They think of fermentation and they think sauerkraut. They think kimchi. They think... Maybe they think beer and wine. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Do they think of of cheese, right? Like, and maybe they think sourdough, but like, but I don't know. I just, I felt like there was really something there because it's like, these three things are not just my favorite things. They are some of humanity's most ancient and essential things. There's a great line in your book when you're talking about fermentation in particular. I want to get this really correct because I love it. It says that uh, feeding your sourdough daily and making new batch of kombucha um, weekly at the risk of sounding like an unhinged hipster. But And I love this, but really, do we have something to thank hipsters for in this rejuvenation in our everyday cooking now? So many of us uh, home cooks are now making uh, kimchi, making um, uh, piccalilies and things like that, sourdough starters, kombucha. We are all doing uh, different versions of this. Do we have the hipsters to thank for that? I mean, I think we have COVID to thank as much as hipsters. <laughs> but no, I, I, I mean, I see, I see your point though. And I think, well, first of all, I love that you use the word rejuvenation, right? Like the hipsters, yeah, may have rejuvenated it because they, they I say they, like I'm sure people would call me a hipster too, but but basically, fermentation is like one of the oldest practices for food, for, for pre-digesting our food, for creating edible foods from things, for transforming foods, right? From milk into cheese, from grain into bread, grapes into wine. This, this process of transformation is as old as you know, agriculture, essentially. I don't know. Do we have hipsters to thank? I think anything that gives due credit to um, an art that has been around for a really long time and brings new attention and energy to it. Yeah, I think that that's really exciting. And so in that case, I would say, yeah, thank you, hipsters. <laughs> Uh, thank you. We should also thank them for that curly moustache revival thing. Definitely. Oh, definitely. I'll I'll give them I'll give them that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Briefly, so we can get into French bread. Why did you choose England for cheese and Italy for wine fermentation in your book? Yeah, this is a really great question because cheese, wine, and bread. I mean, it could have just all been about France. It could have all been about France. And I'm sure some Francophiles are disappointed that it wasn't. Oh, it's a second book, maybe. There's a second <laughs> book. Yeah. I'm just in France this time, guys. For me, it was incredibly circumstantial. Very circumstantial. And, and you know, I say in, in the preface to the book, like, I'm not trying to write an encyclopedia here. If I, if I were, it would be 10,000 times, uh, longer and bigger than already this this pretty chunky <laughs> book is um because there is so much there is just so much and i mean i spent countless hours i spent days weeks months 
at the British Library. I was living in London at the time of, of writing this, which I'll circle back to in just a moment because it plays into why cheeses is in England. But basically, I, I spent so much time at the British Library just researching with my nose in books about fermentation, about these countries, about the cultures and the history, because it is almost impossible to separate these foods from the cultures that I have, I have chosen to look at them in. And each of these countries, by the way, has an incredible history of their own for these products. But this all being said, sorry, I'm, I'm straying from your initial question. Sorry. I was living in London when I had this spark that I already, this spark of the idea that I already um, mentioned to you, which was, whoa, these three favorite things of mine, they're all fermented. And I had actually just done a, uh, a video series um, with the Comte Cheese Association. So I was in France, spent an immersive week in the Jura, right? The region right along the Swiss border, just a deep diving into Comte Cheese. So literally just spending time with the farmers who have the cows whose milk goes to the cheesemakers, and then I would go to the cheesemaker, spend spend days with the cheesemakers, seeing how they put together this wheel, and then I would go and spend time with the affineurs who are maturing the wheels, and you know, time with the cheesemongers who were selling the wheels, and you know what the nuances of taste and what the maturity does and what the season does to the taste. And honestly, Andrew, at the end of of this project for the Comte Cheese Association. I was completely enamored with cheese. Um, I, I, I've always loved cheese and I've always like proclaimed to love cheese, but I, I realized after that experience that I didn't actually know what I was talking about. I didn't, you know, cause everyone's like, Oh, I love cheese. I love cheese. But if you, but like, how does milk become cheese? And if you can't answer that, then it's like, how, how much do you really love this thing then? You love how it tastes, sure. But, but like, let's, let's, like, let's explore, right? Like, let's get curious about this thing that we love. And so I was completely captured um, by that experience. So I went back to London and I remember I had a conversation with my con contact at the Comte Cheese Association. And I told him, essentially what I just told you. I loved that. Thank you so much. Um, I can't stop thinking about cheese. And he said, well, Katie, you live in London. One of the most world famous cheese shops, Neil's Yard Dairy, is, is in London. Uh, you, should, you should reach out to them. Um, and then he actually connected me with someone who, who works there. He's like, I'll send an email connecting you guys. And then like a month later, I started cheesemongering there. So cheese in, in, in England was, was purely because that's where I lived. And that's, that was my, well, ironically though, it was French cheese that opened the door. There, there is good cheese in the UK. There's incredible cheese and incredible cheese history that I, you know, and like this, like I'm going to make myself sound like such a dummy uh, before I, I started writing this book, but I'm, you know, I'm just being honest in hoping that other people can relate as an American in England. I think when I thought cheddar, I thought Wisconsin, I thought orange cheddar from Wisconsin. Cause I'm an American. I don't know. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Ohio. Right. Like that's what I thought. I w was completely ignorant to the very rich history of ch that cheddar cheese was born in England, that there is a town in Somerset called cheddar because that is where cheddar cheese was born, right? And and just the, the rich history of Stilton and all of these specific regional cheeses, Lancashire, Red Leicester, Cheshire. Um, it's such a rich history. And uh, it, it gave me a lot to dive into. First story regarding French bread in your book is an experience about meeting. And I I really want to get her name correct, so please if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But it uh, was a a Apollina from uh, Paulin uh, Bakery. Is that right? Apollonia Paulin. 
Apollonia. Sorry, Desiree. Um, for our listeners that, who might not know, can you tell her, uh, tell us briefly her story because it's a fascinating story. It really is of how she became uh, the the head of the bakery there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Paulen Bakery, or the boulangerie, I should say. Yes, uh, Paulen um, was started by Apollonia's grandfather right around the time of World War II. And then his son, Lionel Paulin, took over. Now, Lionel was just as much a kind of bread philosopher and also very media-savvy businessman as much as he was a baker, right? So his father, the, the, the person who started Paulin, was really, he was a baker, but like a passionate baker and a baker who really believed in natural fermentation, i.e. using sourdough, um, and in quality bread, quality salt, um, because those are the ingredients, right? And, and, and water, right? And so just do the best of these ingredients, natural fermentation. Um, and this was around the time too, when the industry, the, the bread industry that we know it now was really just starting to, to pump out, um, all of the products that are so very common now, uh, even like, uh, dried yeast or fresh or fresh yeast, you know, but like a yeast that you buy versus a yeast that you cultivate, um, as a sourdough. So, so right away that actually differentiated Paulin from its inception, and then Lionel took over, continued this, um, and with this media savvy and with this kind of bread philosophy that he that he espoused, the bakery gained a new level of, of fame, really. Um, people like Robert De Niro, like celebrities, fell in love with Paulin and would have it shipped to the States. You know, I mean, like, it was just, it, it just became the French bread. So Apollonia is the daughter. There are, she, she, and she has a younger sister as well. She was 18 years old and had always, was kind of poised to probably take over the family business one day down the road, right? But she's just very smart young woman, got accepted into Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so went from Paris to, to Cambridge. Um, right around this time, actually just shortly before that, um, her mom and dad uh, were in a fatal helicopter accident. And um, suddenly, Apollonia... 18 years old, newly enrolled at Harvard University, had to decide what she was going to do. Would she take over the company? What would happen to the company? And incredibly, she attended Harvard University and stepped into her father's shoes as the CEO of Paulin at the same time. And so she ran Paulin from her dorm room in Cambridge. There's a, a lovely story about the definition of uh, the French word copain. So, copain yeah. means in copain, French. Yeah, it means friend, right? Co, if you break it down further, right? Copain means friend. But to look at the word co, co meaning togetherness, pain meaning bread. So we, people who you come together with over bread, who you share bread with, who you, as we going back to the beginning of the conversation, who you will rip that baguette in half for. Here, you have one. I'll have the other. That is your friend. Yep. Love that. Yeah. I love it. I love it too. Sourdough and French bread is, uh, I think, something people wouldn't know is there's a history there, I think. The sourdough's sort of been taken over by, you know, in want of a better term, by the hipsters has been something that, well, not no, just the hipsters, right. but it was all something that we made during COVID. But even before that, it was something that was sort of taken over by this modern age. French bread is not just about brioche and baguettes, is it? it the sourdough is heavily involved in the French bread uh, world. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In the the beginning of the bread section of the book, right, I have I have this, this quote um, by Julia Child, and it is, how can a nation be called great if its bread tastes like Kleenex? Yeah. 
And so she's talking, of course, about America <laughs> um, and comparing it to the bread in France. And the taste of bread is so important to French culture. The quality and taste of bread and texture, I mean, everything, not just the taste, but bread to, to French people and to the, the country of France is almost, I mean, it could be on the French flag. It is, is such an uh, ingrained part of this culture. For some people, it's the daily baguette. Uh, for other people, it is brioche, which is which is an enriched bread, right? Like it's it's like the viennoiserie. It's like the weird place between not weird. It's a fantastic place, right? Between a, a sweet and a bread, and so I think that it it really depends on who you talk to of what is French bread. Something that I really learned is that sourdough was the beginning, right? Sourdough is what French bread was, and it all grew from this place and then and then has strayed, has deviated, has become other things is like that as well. And I think that, um, you know, you're getting reference to the, to the French people. There is always going to be somebody that buys their baguettes from a supermarket. Uh, there is always going to be somebody that buys their baguettes from and doesn't care about what's in them. Sure. Uh, but then again, they're like in my town here in Montmorillon, we have uh, three supermarkets that all have boulangeries in them. Um, and I wouldn't, I, I just don't buy my bread from there. I, I just don't because uh, we have uh, um, well, four bakery uh, boulangeries in town. And I would say three of them are just absolutely wonderful. And they're a little bit, they're not the cheapest ones. So there's one cheaper. Um, but you, and you can tell the quality of the cheaper one. Uh, and so it is all about what you value yes. in your bread. Value and is the fact that you can have word. a small town that has all of, that has boulangeries in all three supermarkets, has uh, four other boulangeries in the town. Uh, when they say that that the f small French towns, the boulangeries are dying and that there's now baguette machines, um, interestingly enough, it's true. There is lots of small little hamlets around here that have died, but one of the best bakeries in town has put vending machine, baguette vending machines in those towns. Hmm. So people will pay a premium in those towns mm -hmm. for having a very good baguette yeah. out of a vending machine. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, if the baguette's good, like, who cares how, uh, how they get it? But How it came, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, there I are think, laws around. Oh, yeah. Well, I just I was just wanted to just, I don't know, applaud you for, for just talking about, like, it is, yes, if something's a little more expensive, but it's, it really is what, what we value. And so why is it worth that extra 50 cents, right? Or like in some cases, that's all it is, right? But people will yeah. opt for the one euro versus the 150 euro baguette. But it's like, ooh, but what, what's in those 50 cents? Because there's a reason. There's a reason for that, right? There's a reason for yes. everything. And so to just think about it and think about how how you choose to place value on on these things. Yeah. And for a lot of people, an extra 50 cents is a lot of money. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm not diminishing so, that at all. No. The fact that they can get a baguette, that is the most important thing, I think. Uh, that, you know, Otherwise, they will revolt. Yeah, um, listen. Yeah, yeah. True, true. <laughs> literally. H history has before. shown. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> French Revolution teaches us the, something. Exactly. There are laws around the baguette and uh, what can be called and the ingredients in it and the price, I think, as well. You cannot call yourself a boulangerie unless you bake the bread, you make and bake the bread on premises. The reason they needed to make that a law is because places were shipping in the bread from elsewhere, the, the frozen baguettes and thawing them and, and selling them. And, and how would the consumer know otherwise, right? So... In order to call yourself a boulangerie, you have to make the baguettes there, and and so that's that's a that's a starting point. There, there is a hierarchy of French baguettes, and the laws help to um, clarify this hierarchy. So we've got the there's a regular baguette, a baguette ordinaire, and then a baguette tradition, 
is, and which it looks different because it's the pointy, it's got the pointiness, right? Versus the rounded. So a baguette tradition must, uh, must be a higher quality thanks to this bread decree um, because it says that a baguette tradition can only have four ingredients. And those ingredients are flour, water, a leavening agent, starter, or added yeast, and salt. So this is saying, this law is, is demanding, that is regulating rather, that um, the flour itself can't have any additives. That the dough has to be fermented with a baker's yeast, and it can't be frozen at any point in the production. So these are all things that, without this regulation, uh, bakers would kind of just go to town with, and bread itself, the bread itself is, would be different. Well, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because the quality of the ingredients is what is going to make the bread uh, better or not so, and also the experience and the of the of the baker in the boulangerie. Absolutely. Um, is going to have a big uh, impact on that. I know that there is a, a baguette competition in Paris. Yes. Uh, I've, in my four years of living in Paris, whenever I'd have a, a dinner party, I would often line up at the winner of the baguette uh, competition. You're a good host. But that winner um, is, uh, supplies the baguettes to the Elysee for the year that is the prize of winning and it's a a, um, a great pride that they display in their window whether they've been first second third in the competition it's and something to be proud of line up but it does fascinate me that with this tradition of french bread with the brioches and, and even taking other breads like you like a brioche for an example is from the vinoiserie which is uh, not french um has come from austria the, that you have this la- – when you have foods from around the world, the baguette has gone to Vietnam and become uh, a banh mi. Banh mi. Uh, oh, uh, so uh, good. Mi. Yeah. The, you know, that uh, everybody loves it and everybody around the world will try and master this idea of a French baguette. But you go to an Asian restaurant and or an Indian restaurant – and they will serve a baguette with your yes. with your dish, yeah. as opposed to a naan or a roti. Why is this? What That's, is it about French people? I mean, that, that is so they, French. They can't embrace that. <laughs> That's so French. Well, or they I, have it with it. They will have naan and baguette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's so, it's so French. I remember, my hairstylist in London was half French. And he was talking about how his dad would come visit him in London and we, they would go to like a fish and chips shop. And his dad would be like, well, where's the baguette? Why, why aren't they serving baguette? He's like, this is a fish and chip shop, pop. <laughs> so yeah, it, it really is just a French thing. Um, I also, I want to point out though, going back to this law to, to, to make sure it's, it's really to protect bread uh, the 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 french institution of bread what i think is really interesting as we're talking about bread the culture of bread and the historical importance of bread is that this this bread decree that i was talking about before the decret pain decret pain is that it was it went into law in 1993 that mm. is relatively recent history and and i think that it just goes to show that the French were like, okay, this is starting to get a little out of hand in terms of all of the additives that can go into flowers in terms of frozen things flying in and passing off for something else. Um, we need to put a stop to it. Um, I think it's interesting to note the year. So I just want to tell a little quick story that um, uh, Lenny, my golden retriever, has uh, is very fond of a baguette, and I don't know if many of our listeners will know, and you would know though from seeing this that uh, uh, many a Frenchman will get a baguette and nibble on it throughout the morning, or on their way to work, or on their way home. Uh, and people often they're a bit 
oh, nonchalant, with, I think is the word, I'm not sure, but they're sort of, they're, they're a bit more free with their baguettes as then they'll just walk around, it'll be in their hand and they won't really notice or it'll be hanging out the side of their bag, yes. et cetera. And um, Lenny was very opportunistic, I should say, oh. in the licking of the baguettes oh that would gosh. walk past him as we were walking him around Paris. Oh and gosh. there's been many a time where he has leaked or tried to nibble on somebody's baguette without them knowing. And, of course, my French was never good enough for me to explain to that person that, oh, sorry, my dog's just licked your baguette. Oh, my um, God. Oh my God. So, unfortunately, many a person uh, on our daily trips to the Palais Royal uh, has gone home with a baguette that has been licked by an Australian golden retriever. Oh my gosh! You know, I'm it's prob- it's say. really just um, it's just the extra extra bit of love on that baguette. Terroir. It? it maybe is added is to the terroir oh of God. the of the baguette. I think you're right. Um, I think you've got there it. are many. The, the, this is a tradition, the baguette of uh, of eating this or um, well, letting the dogs lick it, but no, but of eating uh, for your, you know, replacing breakfast with uh, just a baguette to nibble on um, is a little bit of a French tradition. But there are other French traditions with baguettes and especially what do they do at the end of the day when there's leftover baguette? There are so many things to do with a leftover baguette. There are so many, with any kind of leftover bread, it should never go to waste. First of all, you can make it into bread crumbs or croutons. So with croutons, you would obviously cut it into little cubes with bread crumbs. You want to pop that in a food processor um, and then drizzle it with olive oil, pop it in the oven um, and add a little bit of salt. Pop it in the oven just for 10 minutes, just for 10 minutes, 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 180 degrees Celsius. Um you know, give it a good shaky, shaky about halfway through. Make sure it's it's getting all nicely toasted evenly. And there, and there you have croutons that are going to make your next salad, your next soup so much better. Um, yeah. Do you have any favorite ways to use up leftover bread? Tend to breadcrumbs is a good one. And also um, uh, bread and butter pudding. I love oh, butter pudding. yes. Yes. Especially Thank you. that's actually... My my favorite um, thing to do is uh, leftover croissants. Not that there usually is any, but just in yeah, yeah. series, I often make a bread and butter pudding with those. Uh, um, and and no, with a brioche but, too is is yes. just incredible. Uh, I think that the whole town feeds the here in Montmorillon. The whole town feed the ducks uh, with the leftover bread. You can definitely say tell by the size of them. Oh no, we don't have we don't have full speed foie gras here in uh, Montmorillon. We just have the whole town feeding the ducks bread. Oh my uh, God. Which actually, there's a whole thing around um, that they you get uh, often. Somebody will come across the bridge as we're feeding the ducks and make sure that we're not throwing it in the river um, at them too large because it can get caught in their throat Yikes. so you really have to um do that uh make sure that the crumbs are small oh wow and uh also it's terrible for lenny and louis my golden retrievers to look at us throwing bread away yeah uh, at the ducks they don't like that at no all. no i imagine um my bedside table is actually um for one of giving away too much information to everybody um but my be- bedside table is actually an old baguette box where they used to store that people used to have a box oh, for people that. probably still do have a box to store their baguettes. They would buy them for the whole week and store them uh, in there. It's quite a cute little thing. Well, and just a quick note too uh, is that sourdough helps preserve bread longer. So a baguette made with sourdough, that baguette will last longer. And so that's probably why you know these baguette boxes from back in the day. Well, that's probably their baguettes were probably made with sourdough and they did last longer. So you. It was okay to put them in a box to eat throughout the week versus, you know, other baguettes that are do not come from, as we just talked about, a boulangerie, right? That are that are made in some other fashion. Um, what's your favorite boulangerie in Paris? <gasps> Whoa, that's such a hard question. Because I so oh, come on. I know, but for the book, I I apprenticed at multiple boulangeries around the city. Oh, mm-hmm. and I, I I don't know if I can choose a favorite. Are you going to make me choose a favorite? Mine is Rue de Nil oh. in the second because that was around the corner from me. Oh, yeah. Well, so much baguette. of it is also just the... convenience. 
Yes. Oh, no, no, but they actually do do an amazing baguette and they're part of the Frenchie group um, with the Frenchie restaurants and the Frenchie to go and the Frenchie wine bar. Uh, but that whole, the street there at Rue de Nil has been changed completely with the, due to those, the Frenchie group and the yeah, belongs yeah. Yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, it's that is an there. amazing little strip though. And French yeah, is so good. They have uh, they use organic flour. It's mm. it, it's a real testament to this idea of of your baguette is going to be better when the ingredients are better. Absolutely. But well, speaking of, you did uh, yeah. you did uh, stage at uh, Le Petit Gratin in the twentieth. Le Petit Gratin. How Grand. was that experience? Yeah, Grand, it sorry, was. Grand. It was There's amazing. A, yeah, in in Belleville, it was it was awesome. Um, and then that led to the next stage I did at Le Brichetant um, in the 12th, I believe. Um, yeah, both of those places are were so cool. And again, it was like, you know, I'm talking now in, in this conversation with you, I'm talking like, oh yeah, like an, the appreciation for all these things. This was such a learning curve for me, Andrew. Like but when I started this book and when I started researching it, and when I started doing these stages, I I was I really didn't know. I didn't understand. And maybe conceptually I, I got it, but it was getting my hands dirty, seeing it, making it, eating it, tasting it, um, that really hammered these points really home for me. And that's why I, I do talk about it now with like, you know, conviction, I think in some ways is because it's like, well... That that is what I learned from being in these places. Yeah, uh, just briefly, um, can you let us know what for those that don't know what is a stage? So stage yeah. is uh, spelt S T A G E, so like stage. Yeah, but it's not a stage where you go on and you perform. Oh, I'm into bread. <laughs> yeah, performing. About I mean, bread. I'd be down for that. Um, though. I'd be down yeah. for that. Yes. Um, what is a stage? For a those, stage those is. That don't know. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, a stage is basically an apprenticeship. So it is going and working um, often for free at a restaurant, a boulangerie, what, what have you. Um, a lot of chefs from Le Cordon Bleu also stage in restaurants um, around France. And basically, you just learn. You just learn. You do what you're asked to do. And you you learn by observation and you learn by doing. From your experiences in those stages in boulangeries, what tips can you give the home cook for making bread at home? I would say to have an antenna up about everything else that's around you and your sourdough. So yes, you want to take care of your, your dough. And if you're making bread, you know, like, you have your recipe in many cases, you're adding a certain amount of flour, a certain amount of water. But what I learned from staging in these places was this understanding of everything, of atmosphere, of what is the humidity, what's the weather outside and what's the weather inside and how does the humidity outside affect what's happening inside the bakery? Because these are things that... that in order to make the best loaf of bread that you're going to make, these are all things that need to be tweaked in the dough mix because those things affect the starter and affect how the dough will respond to the yeast. Um, so it's really keeping an eye out. And so if it's a really cold December day, the water that you're adding to your dough mix should be a little warmer versus if it's a really hot day, you know, then don't have that same kind of warm water because you're looking to strike this balance and you need to adjust it based on everything else that's going around you. Fabulous. Katie Quinn, thank you so much for joining us on Fabulously Delicious. It's been fabulous having you here. And <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll get to talk again another time in the future about uh, more things French fabulous food. Agreed. It was fabulous. Thank you for having me on. How fabulous is Katie and so much knowledge about French bread. I especially love the information about the laundries and the law. Oh, and Katie's amazing work history from entertainment in New York to food. If you like this episode of Fabulously Delicious, please follow me wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a review on how fabulous Fabulously Delicious is. 
It's a really good tongue twister. For anyone who'd like to support Fabulous Delicious and myself in making it, you can do so by buying me a cup of coffee. The link is in the description below. Next week, we are drinking, not eating, the wines of Burgundy with Preston Moore. This is Fabulously Delicious, and I'm Andrew Pryor. And as I always say, whatever you do, do it fabulously. A bientôt. Bon app.